What we're going to do here, we're going to have uh, our first speaker speak for a minute, um, Yindrich Vivorville, uh, as the former drug policy coordinator of the Czech Republic and one of the leading experts on drugs issues. He has over 20 years of experience in the management and development of health and social services and related programs. Since the 1980s, he has worked systematically on establishing, developing, and evaluating community services, particularly in the area of drug prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation. It is really our honor and our, and our great privilege to have uh, uh, such a, a great expert and uh, such a great ally to our work, really, seriously, a great ally and, and help to our uh, work as, like I said, uh, non-governmental organizations and civil society. It's been an honor. And, uh, and a pleasure to have you at our side and call you our colleague. So without further ado, I'll give the floor to Yinja. Yeah, hello, everybody. How are you? How are you feeling? <laughs> good, 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 good. I know it's late evening, so we'll keep it as lively as possible. Um, Yes, thank you for my introduction. I worked in government for years now, but I'm back in uh, civil society myself now, so I'm, I'm free, I'm relaxed <laughs> now, I'm happy. Uh, though I am still in politics, obviously. Uh, yes, and may, maybe also I would add one more thing. Uh, we were the first country, 2013, under my office, when we drafted the law uh, about uh, allowing medical cannabis to, to be produced and, and, and uh, prescribed and used in Czech Republic. At that point, it was a gov uh, conservative government, conservative prime minister, the chair, chair of the uh, parliament was conservative. Uh, I didn't know that we are the first one in, in the world at that time. I thought that we just following the, the, the trend. The, the trend, yeah. yes. And I thought it's obviously obvious, and it took us only three months to pass it through the parliament. Wow. But anyway, so um, I will introduce first, for, uh, well, this is this framework of this, uh, let's say, panel. I should be, uh, let, let me paraphrase what you have on the program. Looking at the situation, I would say we are in the, some crossroad. Uh, we are still in a harsh, strict, prohibitive times, but we all feel that something is going to happen or is about to happen. We don't know. We only don't know how and when and who, but it will obviously somehow start changing. It's already changing. Uh, we would like to have the changes faster, maybe. Some will want, <laughs> will want to stop it, obviously. So let us hope that we will find some good balance in it. So uh, the, first, uh, the first speaker is on video. Is Kenzie going to send it? Kenzie? Oh, somebody. Or shall I do it? Uh, the panel is a little bit changed to, to what we expected. We, we had the uh, ex-Minister of Health of Czech Republic come in today, but he excused himself because he just had fever, 39 degrees, so we had to excuse him. And we have another key presenter. Okay, I will start introducing it. Uh, he is... Uh, he acted for years as uh, in envoy of General Secretary of UN uh, for HIV AIDS uh, in Asia and Eastern Europe, uh, Mr. Michel Kazachkin, and we have his video. It's not going to be a Hollywood film, though. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm pleased to address this short message on behalf of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. It is clear that in the last 10 years, and not to say in the last 80 years since uh, cannabis was reviewed by the Health Committee of the Ligue des Nations, we've seen dramatic changes. Dramatic changes in the, the ways the society sees cannabis in the legislative context in a number of states and countries, in our knowledge on the potential 
therapeutic benefits of cannabis and in the science of drugs and drugs dependence on general. So the cannabis revolution is taking place and yet as we're speaking cannabis and cannabis resins are listed in schedule 1 and 4 respectively and this means that formally both remain prohibited worldwide and that implicitly the CND does not recommend cannabis to be used medically and this despite the growing evidence of medical use globally and of the availability of pharmaceutical preparations with uh, marketing authorizations in, in many countries. As we speak also, many countries continue to struggle with the negative impact and the consequences of prohibition, including arrests, over-incarceration, <coughs> disproportionate sentencing and growth of criminal markets. The recent recommendation by the expert committee of WHO that cannabidiol is not scheduled and the pre-reviews of cannabis, resin, extract, plant and of THC in preparation for the TND discussion and decisions to be taken uh, are, I believe, significant steps. In addition to progress in science and progress in, in policy, uh, we also now have data and I believe the, the distance to the facts that allow us to appreciate and evaluate different models of legal regulation of cannabis in various states and countries across the Americas and Europe. We at the Global Commission uh, welcome these changes and these evolutions. All of them are decreasing the gap between the evidence and the policies and hopefully they preempt changes that could occur later with more and other drugs. Our advocacy, as you know, is about all drugs, not only about cannabis, and it is place the health and safety of people first, decriminalize drugs, and move progressively to legally regulated markets ending prohibition. I wish you all a constructive and fruitful discussion and good deliberations at the conference. So this is a message of uh, Global Commission. Those who don't know what Global Commission is, it's a formation, let's say, of, um, of top rank politicians such as, such as Kofi Annan used to be among them in, in Global Commission. Uh, Ex-president of Mexico, Cardozo, uh, Javier Solana, ex um, Ex-General uh, Secretary, I'm not sure if, if that is the right, correct title of uh, NATO uh, and few other people including uh, uh, people like other presidents and, uh, and mayors of major cities, etc. There you go. Number of, of uh, people. Uh, I will ask uh, my colleague sitting next to me uh, to, to do some kind of a summary of, of the day as well. Uh, Dominic Korva, who is an academic, um, uh, who works in uh, uh, Washington State Center for Cannabis and Social Policy. I will not make it longer to free interaction. You can do it. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to FAT and the organizers for inviting me here today. Um, I have been given a, a task of doing a synthesis of the day. Um, it's described as an academic synthesis, which sounds really dry. Uh, I, I don't want to go on at length necessarily on my own tangent, and so I want to set it up with a fairly simple framework. 
uh, that will be, I think, more easily digested if you understand that I come to this as someone who did his PhD on the intersection of the drug war in Bolivia and essentially um, the financial crisis in Bolivia, neoliberalization. So market liberalization on the one hand that was being pushed on Bolivia by the IMF and the World Bank, and also the drug war, which is the opposite of market liberalization being pushed on Bolivia in the context of extreme financial crisis. Uh, that was a recipe not only for a social movement, the Cocoleros, to actually um, uh, to create essentially a market that integrated a country that had no dollars to import medicine or food um, to get them through the crisis. And then later on, they led the other social movements essentially in um, uh, democratically overthrowing what was a post-colonial uh, uh, regime, very friendly to the United States, and uh, very accommodating to the IMF and the World Bank. Um, so I, I, I come from this from studying essentially a post-colonial context, a third world context, that's kind of about economic imperialism and also you know, actual drug war imperialism. And while I was doing that work, a couple of things happened. Um, one was cannabis liberalization you know, on the west coast of the United States uh, proceeded fairly rapidly. And then there was also a financial crisis in the United States in 2008. Uh, the combination of those events and what I saw in terms of the domestic market exploding caused me to think, well, well, obviously, this is what happened in Bolivia when there was a financial crisis, as people went into the informal economy. Uh, and it's not the same thing, but it, there's, there's a certain resonance here that I wanted to explore. And so I went to Humboldt County, uh, California, to explore the domestication of cannabis agriculture uh, over uh, a period of time that was from the 1960s to the present. And I found it to be a place that was both lost in time and about to be subject to time real fast. Um, so at the same time, I also want to kind of state my positionality as uh, someone who has been you know, a cannabis user uh, since his 20s. Um, I think I've retroactively understood how I can be a cannabis user in a, uh, certain ways that I won't bore you with. Um, I will say it's kind of related to um, the results of Dr. Michelle Sexton, Sexton's survey of cannabis users and uh, their stated reasons why they were using cannabis as medicine in which about 70% of respondents said they were using it for anxiety and depression. Uh, and I, I, I do believe retroactively and, and probably to this day uh, uh, that is my therapeutic reason for using cannabis. Um, so I'm a deinstitutionalized academic. That is, I started up an NGO. I left academia. Uh, I taught uh, at Sir Lawrence College. Uh, was the last place that uh, I had a position at. Uh, I was teaching Latin American political economy, and I was really interested, actually, in going in a different direction and Washington State uh, voted to legalize cannabis. So very optimistically, uh, I decamped from my academic course um, and started up an NGO. I, I essentially gave myself tenure um, and a certain amount of freedom uh, to do um, certain kinds of popular education work and work within communities around this, at the time, what seemed to be very exciting and, and, and promising you know, legalization. Uh, some things happened along the way that made me actually rethink um, the framework of, of, of what I was studying, which is that what we got was certainly legalization in terms of regulation and uh, uh, revenue production, but it came with prohibition as well. And of course, it came with prohibition in a very easy to understand way in that there was still federal prohibition, right? Uh, there was still prohibition on under 21 uh, consumption. There were increased penalties, actually, for people under the age of 21. This is, uh, you know, sort of a surprising result is that what comes with regulation is also further criminalization in some ways. 
Uh, and um, this tension made me start to think about this, this complex landscape as post-prohibition rather than legalization. Is that what I'm studying here is legalization with prohibition, not after prohibition, right? Um, and, and I think it's fairly simple to understand that in a, uh, uh, a geographical sense, and that certainly at the very least, you know, prohibition as law is overlapping with, you know, legalization as law. Uh, and it's, of course, quite different across the United States and around the world, right? So this is meant to be a, you know, a critique of essentially the emergence of legalization that retains really a critique of the drug war, right? And, and that's my concern, really, is that uh, I come from really an interest in studying the drug war as a problem in the context of especially uh, supposedly you know, uh, liberal democracy, right, and the, 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 the end of history. Uh, where we would all be governed through freedom instead of authoritarianism. But of course, that's not what has been going on. Um, and so I like to think of this as, you know, there's a deconstructive engagement when I'm studying the persistence of the drug war and, and prohibition, not just as a legal phenomenon, but as a cultural phenomenon uh, and an economic phenomenon. Uh, very obviously, in legal states in the United States, uh, you know, half, half of the counties and municipalities in each of these states actually don't allow legal cannabis. Um, certainly consumption is legal, possession is legal up to an ounce, but, you know, there's still a ban on, you know, production or participation in the markets, which is sort of counterproductive to a number of things. So there's a deconstructive approach, really, to the study, which is the drug war is still a problem, I, I, and I want to keep that salient, and I, because that's, that's the point of getting rid of the drug war. And then there's also a constructive engagement, essentially, with legalization, right? Where there are new arguments and ways to present evidence, essentially, uh, under conditions of, essentially, you know, freedom, uh, to talk about many of the things that have been talked about today, for example, and, and certain kinds of research that have been opened up. So. I'm looking at this as, you know, these two tracks that are kind of going back and forth, and all of these speakers are engaging in both of these things. Uh, some of them more constructive and some of them more deconstructive, but I'd like to tell you the story of today kind of through that framework, is this the constructive engagement within liberalism and the deconstructive engagement against the authoritarianism of prohibition. So within liberalism, the constructive engagement is really, you know, uh, the war of knowledge, right, is like is actually contesting institutional and official knowledge that supports essentially irrational policy, and you do that by presenting facts and gathering evidence, because under conditions of liberalism, it's facts and evidence that carry the day. That's what makes policy, not politics, right? Not the politics of knowledge. The politics of knowledge belongs in in the other category. It's the arbitrary exercise of sovereign power to just you know, do things, right? And so let's talk about how we started. And we started with the, uh, ecology and the environment, and Tony and Ryan started us off. And, and Tony centered us on the idea that actually environmental impacts associated with cannabis cultivation should be understood as the environmental impacts of, of prohibition, right? Of cultivation as a set of practices that developed under conditions of prohibition. And of course, in Humboldt County, uh, that's the place to, to study that. And so. Obviously, you have unregulated and increasingly industrial-style agriculture in places where that didn't belong, right? That's how you get dewatering. That's how you get environmental impacts, is that, you know, this wasn't ag land uh, with, you know, easy access to water and actually native soil that, that works all that well. There, there are parts, certainly, uh, of those watersheds where that does work. Um, so he wanted to focus on the environmental harms of, of prohibition, but also he wanted to talk about, well, also the environmental harms of legal production, because industrial agriculture causes legal, uh, causes environmental problems, right? Pesticides, you know, is the very obvious one. Um, you know, Rachel Carson's book, really about industrial ag and pesticides, launched the environmental movement in the United States. Uh, so we have new kinds of environmental impacts that are associated with legal cannabis cultivation, and they're not special, 
to cannabis, they're special to how we do our agriculture and food systems, right? So we want to be able to study these topics and, uh, and, and uh, you know, address them in a certain way, right? There is also, besides the agricultural part of it, it's, it's the production of plastics and packaging in the interest, to, essentially, of doing these tightly controlled, uh, you know, sales um, that have emerged, uh, essentially, as part of our regulated and taxed, you know, um, market. So, so after Tony came Ryan talking about the emergence of, you know, craft cannabis, and small farms, and, and he began to express a positive set of values that were fairly constructive, uh, and drew upon a legal landscape that includes, you know, really craft economies, which of course have been, uh, you know, utterly wrecked by essentially uh, post-industrial uh, global markets, but have also emerged in a certain way around uh, ethical consumerism, for example, uh, and fair trade, and so forth, and craft beer. Right? There, there are different ways in which we see the emergence of, of things that are more sustainable and local and, and um, you know, built on relations of, of, uh, of trust and certain kinds of moral values, right? And these are not completely stamped out by capitalism. In fact, there are spaces and ways to attempt to do that, and that's a constructive engagement, right? Um, on the other side of it, then, we got a series of folks that, that really were talking about the benefits of hemp, hemp and hemp products, from the brick batteries, uh, Carl's brick batteries, uh, uh, Steve's hempcrete, um, Boaz's discussion of benefits of hemp, and Hannah's uh, discussion of you know, benefits of, 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 of farming seed, fiber, and so forth. And I would put these in the category of constructive engagements. These are attempts to influence and change policy based on evidence, right? Uh, this is a positive thing that is actually more possible under, you know, the, the current conditions of legal cannabis. These discourses are acceptable. We can present this evidence because uh, it's here and we can show it to you, right? Um, and so, you know, that works against the persistence of prohibition by presenting, you know, ra rational evidence, right? Uh, and telling us all about that. So we got to learn quite a bit about that. Although. There were quite a few speakers compressed early in the day. I'm not sure how many of you were here early in the day, and they got to give you a taste. Uh, I like to think of it as almost a movie trailer for, you know, like a, which should be a two-hour movie, but you got like a five-minute or two-minute snippet, right? And that was, that was what was going on, especially earlier in the morning, uh, the first two panels. So panel two, uh, socioeconomic uh, perspectives of markets also had this uh, sort of dual track. Um, that uh, different folks are working on. And by the way, I had 20 minutes to pull together this, uh, <laughs> this whole thing. Um, and uh, I think it's, it, it'll work, but forgive me, I'm gonna have to look at my notes, right? So let's start with Kenza's uh, discussion of what was going on in Morocco. And Kenza's approach was on the deconstructive side of things. Uh, although it was a little more nuanced than deconstructing prohibition, it was deconstructing essentially, are you serious? No, 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 no. I was told that if I'm recapping the whole thing, yeah. I was getting at least 20 minutes. Take, finish as fast as you can. Do your best. Nobody told me, like... No, no problem, Don. Okay. No All right. Suggestive. Okay, <laughs> so let's talk about essentially, uh, you know, Kenza's approach to uh, neo-colonial dynamics, economic exploitation, disruption of traditional agriculture, traditional botany, or, or in particular, traditional genetic material that was going on and causing actually environmental problems as well as the disruption of essentially livelihoods. Um, you had Robert Hoban on the constructive side of things, much more optimistic, managing motivations and partnerships, uh, the act of making connections. I appreciated that discourse. Uh, the optimism of, of, of building bridges, uh, although, you know, a little less critical, perhaps, of, uh, you know, um, the globalization of these connections. Um, I think Patty's talk about the cannabis social clubs as a grassroots model in Spain gave us something constructive as well. It gives us a model that's not the same as this very tight, tightly controlled tax and regulate model, and it had its drawbacks and it had its advantages, and there are things to learn from it, right? 
Uh, and that, to me, was deconstructive of our regulatory structures, maybe, and the way we're doing it in the United States, uh, but also quite constructive in offering a path forward and a self-reflexive critique of what was going on. Um, we had Jonathan uh, from Aurora, very optimistic about corporate social responsibility. I'll leave it at that. Um, and we had uh, Michaelis talking about economic crisis and essentially a deconstruction of how we do global capitalism and how actually the cannabis markets in Greece were much like the Bolivian situation or, or the, the financial crisis in California, um, efforts uh, to create resilience. And Manu's discussion of what was going on in New Zealand also was about resilience and fair trade. So you had a deconstructive or critical approach to globalization and a constructive approach to how cannabis can help with that, right? Panel three, uh, Myrtle, Amy, Crystal, Daniela, and Patty. Um, this one I can do all together here. Uh, the constructive side of it was about gender equality and, and recognition, right? And, and actually, you know, um, it's about having women in leadership positions, no matter what those leadership, whether it's a corporation or a small one, it's absolutely positive to get that diversity. And then there was a deconstructive element talking about redistribution and the importance of actually, you know, uh, different kinds of values that women bring to the table that maybe help with some of the destructiveness of the economy. And then I want to actually highlight a very interesting example of stigma management uh, and the valorization of difference, as it was the women who got up here and said, okay, normalization is great, but also, we want the right to be seen as stoners and for stoners to be seen as valid, like these images of us smoking a, a blunt in the picture or vaping or eating, however it is, like it's okay to be a stoner, right? Uh, and, and women kind of creating that space for that instead of you have to be normal, you can smoke pot, but you have to look really normal to be accepted, right? So the, the women brought us something very interesting there. Panel, what's that? Yeah, but I, I just got told I had two minutes about five minutes ago. <laughs> yeah? So, thank you. Uh, panel four, um, Michelle talking about harm reduction as a critique of the law, not just a critique of drug use itself, right? Um, she was also talking about, constructively about, pulling in industry financing, absent state support. Social movements need economies. They need money and if there's one thing that you know, industry has the potential to provide in the post-prohibition context, it's financial support for activism. And so that's something I think that has to be worked on, but that is a, a positive and constructive thing, right? Um, Olivia talked about evidence, a very constructive side of things, evidence against essentially pseudoscience. He gave us uh, a rundown of scientific evidence and this was fairly consistent in this panel. Uh, everybody did this. Um, but I want to highlight uh, Olivier's uh, um, part in it. Oscar talked about discourses and propaganda in a, in a very deconstructive way. Um, inequality and, and civil penalties. So we think about people in jail as a problem, but what about poor people getting fined 600 euros for consuming cannabis in public? That is a punitive civil penalty. Um, and it falls disproportionately upon poor people being affected by essentially economic crisis. Um, Olivier also talked about set and setting in a global sense. I won't get into that too much, but I think that when we talk about set and setting, we have to think about what's going on in society at large, because that's the grand set and setting in which we are all operating. And if society is sick, if our economies are producing inequality and crisis and, and, and poverty, well, and we're supposed to be managing stress, essentially, with our uh, endocannabinoid system and supplementation of that, then our set and setting for using cannabis is healthy when we're talking about a sick society that we're dealing with and managing that. Um, finally, panel five. Uh, Franjo, uh, pardon me if that, the, I, I don't pronounce that right, really had a, a beautiful review of uh, evidence and brought up the importance of education and, and talked about that educational process, not just happening of consumers, but of doctors, and the need actually, if we're going to turn this system over to doctors, they should know what they're doing. 
And we, it, it's, it's, it's clearly, you know, the present company extremely excluded, much more rare um, than it should be. You know, we, we're turning over a system to people who are completely ignorant about the actual evidence and, and science around cannabis. And that ignorance is politically induced and that is a deconstructive move. Uh, Pavel talked about flexibility and local control, a realism, a, an approach that is realistic with respect to the global UN treaties. We can say that they're in our way, the treaties are in our way, and they, they influence us in a certain way, but there is a freedom within them. And it is up to us to make our countries represent our interests and use that flexibility. So the importance of democracy is very, very important, and the importance of functioning democracies is really, really important. So we can push, but if we aren't getting representative government, then we need to fix that too, not just cannabis. We need to fix democracy, right? Um, right. Because institutions have inertia, right? They, they, they're slow to change. They don't have a lot at stake other than maintaining their authority. And, but nonetheless, you have to be pragmatic and you have to understand the institutional openings and you have to use them. Uh, and finally, Catherine talked about the specific model of, of Switzerland and how change is happening actually really fast. And I think that was a really optimistic note to end on. Now, this is a case of a, a global local or, or, or local, the locality of a global phenomenon. And there's just in a, a few short years, so much has changed and so much has opened up. So we are in a moment that's extremely dynamic and there's an opportunity really to continue to push, uh, I think on both the constructive side, talking about cannabis and, and the reality of cannabis, and then the deconstructive side is we continue, need to continue to push against prohibition it does remain, uh, ignorance does remain, and it's not always just evil people, it's habits, it's cultural, and we have to convince people and so forth. So going forward, I think, um, I think that I'm, I'm really excited about what's happened here today, and uh, I really love the relationship between both the constructive and deconstructive approaches here, and I hope you enjoyed my recap. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you, man. thank you for that. Sorry about all the time constraints and pressure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for for excellent uh, summary. Sorry for bothering you with the time. <laughs> A little stressed. Uh, we have, let's say, what? How how long do we have? 15 minutes so to, to talk. Do you, do, you have, do you still have energy to talk a little bit? Yes. I, think, uh, I think that's a vote. Uh, yes, that's a vote. Good. I have a lot of questions that I think we should talk over and over maybe. Uh, <laughs> and things that come out of all this. Uh, I don't want to summarize what you summarized, not at all. But um, I, I have questions that we, I think maybe we can... There are different people also in the audience. Hanka also uh, is here on behalf of the hemp industry, let's say. We have some members of parliament here as well, Czech parliament uh, a colleague who uh, just recently uh, proposed uh, in Czech parliament um, uh, the self-growing to be legal. Uh, I'm sure there are other people here as well. So. Let's maybe discuss a little bit. Yeah, uh, I kind of try to also do a little bit different framework. Uh, what what is actually cannabis? We, it's uh, for many people, it's a business opportunity, isn't it? Uh, you talk. We talked about it. You talked about it here. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, uh, agricultural product that has different kind of possibilities, isn't it? It's uh, not only only medical side of it, it's also for medical side uh, as a pharmaceutical possibility, but also we, we use cannabis for all kind of uh, uh, things uh, with the, in the hemp industry. <clears throat> but for many people, it's, it's a substance which is forbidden and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of, of law and a matter of repression. So we all talk about all these kind of things. Uh, 
for many people, it's, it's, a, it's a recreational substance, psychotropic substance, similar to how we use alcohol and other substances, but alcohol among the legal ones. Uh, also, it's, it's one of the drugs among other prohibited drugs, which we often, on this type of conference, forget to, to realize that uh, what is actually cannabis? Is it separate from the other drugs, or is it, is it the first step to, to realize that the whole prohibition is a really complicated concept which actually brought a lot of nonsense, a lot of atrocities, etc. Thank you. Uh, so I've got questions and I think let's talk about it. One question that I have, where do we go from here? What do we do? Are we, are we campaigning, are we thinking that we should uh, have cannabis industry fully legal, uh, similarly to what we know with alcohol? Yes. 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 Or do we actually take all drugs, including alcohol and tobacco, and, and rethink the concept of a regulated market? Yes. yes. Maybe. Um, <laughs> she said, seed to sale tracking on hops for beer <laughs> to, to create parity, I, I, I suppose. It, do we, uh, because cannabis soon, I mean, I've been for many years uh, involved in international drugs policy as well as the national drug policy. Many of you know probably that the uh, Czech Republic was at some point in lead of decriminalizing drugs policy altogether. Uh, do we realize or do we take cannabis as a raw model, how it can happen with other drugs? Because at some point, I know what is going to happen. Even conservative politicians will say, okay, cannabis is fine. Let's go harder on the other drugs. Mm -hmm. So uh, do we realize that and how do we work with that? I think this is, these are all important questions. I think let's talk about it a little bit. I mean, what do you think, Dominic, about it? What do you think, Hanka? What do you think, uh, Tomas? Uh, other people, I think uh, we can. Can anybody help me with microphone here? We got one. Around. Yes, okay, yeah, yeah. microphone around. I, I have to stand. I, I, I give the floor do, to Dominic. And then I'll, there is a uh, hand up there, hand up here, two, three, yes, four. I'll keep this really brief. I think that... Uh, Anna, please introduce yourself when you speak, yes, or what? Boom. Please is that microphone. we should be pragmatic, that we have to recognize what the opening is in what place, right? And some of that is learning from other places. Obviously, we have Portugal as a model of decriminalization of that's probably more uh, substantial than others. But I think that, that, that we have to be strategic. We have to have solidarity across places, but we have to work in place. We have to work locally, because I believe that really the fundamental change happens locally and culturally. Uh, and that can be connected to you know, global solidarity, but I think uh, pragmatism is very important and organizing is very important. Okay, thank you. There was a hand up there. Sorry, I can't Hi, see. I don't uh, have my glasses. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Sagar. I'm from London, UK. Um, and a lot of people, there was mention of Sativex, and I'd been to two medicinal conferences um, with um, medical establishment in London in the last few months. And a few of the things I learnt was, I mean, this is well known in the UK, people are talking about Sativex, but no one's talking about the fact that north of England has got is producing one of the largest quantities of cannabis in the world. And the complicity within the ministers of our own government whose husbands have stakes in these companies. So yes, we need to be active, but we need to know what we're being active about. We need to know what is the truth. And why is it on one side, the 
many of the people I know who can't get access to the stuff that I can, they are told that this plant is a drug and it's illegal and it's like cocaine. But on the other side, we've got the ministers in my own government, Theresa May's husband and Atkins' husband. They own the largest amount of shares in arms companies and GW, which is outsourcing it to British Sugar. And we don't ask questions about that. So when I see that, and when these conspirators are doing this against us see this, they think, well, if these people are not going to hold us to account, the people who pay their taxes to us, then of course we can do what the hell we want to. And I think we need to have a discussion about that. And with reference to especially what I've seen in Canada or the US, where there's a lot of talk about the free right to grow movement, which has also been mentioned here. But I don't think we should take one side step for one second when it's to do with talking about cannabis and legalization. In the UK, everyone's getting excited. First of December, it's legalized. No, it was not. The only thing that's been legalized, as, according to my understanding, is the corporate version of cannabis, which was either Sativex or Bedrocan. But the plant itself has not been made. <laughs> the plant itself, like turmeric, has not been made legal. I'm sure someone would like to make turmeric illegal and get curcumin and make that legal. In Canada, again, I don't know the full story. People are saying it's made legal. No, the only thing I understand has been made legal has been certain strains of cannabis, which you would have to get from certain companies, just like the farmers are obliged to only get certain seeds from Monsanto. So are we asking the right questions and challenging those people in authority with the right questions and actually say, the best way to vote is to just not pay our taxes. Then they can do nothing. But are we asking the right questions? Um, you know, medicinally, um, we really need to actually show these governments who are actually complicit. They've got stakes in the cannabis companies. What's up with that? And we, we really need to ask what, what is going on in here. And, do we ultimately want sovereign sovereignty of cannabis? Or do we want to relinquish it to the companies who will then sell it to us on the NHS at inflated prices? As I learned from one lady in the US, for a 10 mil, 10% CBD, 2% THC on the NHS, it's gonna cost 2,400 euros a month. That's how much. And that is okay. the facts I've got from people. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Very valid points. So I'm not sure who, who was the second person, okay? Please keep your comments and questions short, as short as possible. Linda Hendry, Legalise Cannabis Campaign, Scotland. My members get very annoyed if cannabis is called a drug. It's a four-letter word that we're hardly allowed to print in our Facebook or Twitter. They say cannabis is a plant. I'm too old to start campaigning for all drugs. If users of all drugs want to campaign for legal heroin, that's fine for me. In Scotland, you can grow poppies, but you're not allowed to slash them. I'd like people in Scotland to be able to grow coca bushes because I think coca tea would be okay. But I'm not into things being refined. And I do rather wonder about some of the things that they're making cannabis into these days. Okay, thank you. <laughs> who, who was the third? I'm sorry, I think you were the third, Hanka was the fourth. Yes. Very quickly then, um, many politicians have declared a war on drugs. In my opinion, all war is criminal. You ask us where to go from here, my feeling is to bring legal action against these criminals who adopt policy which is totally criminal and to bring justice to the world. Thank you. Okay, um, hello, my name is Luke, um, filmmaker and hemp activist. There are not a few scientists who say that we've got 12 years or less than 20 years, as uh, Hanka has said beforehand, to 
have a turnover regarding this climate, let's call it, uh, situation. And um, it's, it's necessary, I think, to talk about, okay, once we, um, you know, decriminalize or legalize cannabis, what has this to do with other drugs? But I personally, as a maybe representative of a young, call it Generation Y or whatsoever, I want to talk about this plant. What can this plant do for this planet? How can this plant serve uh, as a way to not cut down rainforest for soy? How can this plant give proteins to stop killing animals? How can this plant give me medicine that is coming without um, side effects that might kill me or my relatives? How can this plant serve as housing, shelter, biofuel, and so on. And therefore, I think we, we need to broaden this conversation. Let's not get blind by and get excited because it might get easier to smoke. That's fine, but it's the smallest part of this plant. It's the most holistic plant we have on this planet. It's the first mean of mass uh, of mass media, uh, you know, the Gutenberg Bible has been printed on hemp paper. This plant has been in part of human history forever, and we have now the chance to use this plant to change, to plant a, a system that is actually sharing benefits with everyone. And what's, what I see happening right now at the very moment is a very few people get lots of shares, and most of the people, unfortunately, get excited about smoking up, which is fine again, but this is the wrong direction, and I'm scared of this because I think we can do much better, and we have to do much better because we have only a couple years left, and in the end we'll be like, literally like, we could have planted such an amazing future, and we can still plant it, but please let's consider the actual potential of hemp. Because now is the time, now we can do it. People 5,000 years ago knew how to use that plant better than we have nowadays with all the technology. And we have to not only legalize, but decriminalize and to let everyone do whatever they want to do with this plant. With this plant, with every plant. Thank you. Just, I, I have a, just kind of one point, I guess I want to say about this topic of all drugs. I, I, I remember when uh, Sandy Burbank started her organization in Oregon called Mothers Against Misuse and Abuse Mamas. And her idea was, let's look at each substance individually on its own merits or its own you know, problems, benefits, and, and deal with these, each substance individually. And, and on that line of thought, I think we need to come up with a subset of, of substances that we would, I guess, use the soft drug, hard drug model. And we come up with a subset of drugs or substances or plant materials that we consider to be safe enough that we would allow broad access with not only the idea of allowing access and freedom, but also to mitigate the harms of the worst drugs by allowing people access to drugs that are more manageable. In other words, uh, allow them access to cannabis with the hope that they maybe would smoke less crack. Because in the streets, th this is what happens. You go to buy cannabis, they're out. Well, here, have some crack. You know, so uh, you don't get crack offered to you at a coffee shop. Yeah, yeah, well, different dealers. So, but anyway, if we could come up with a subset, I think, of soft drugs, so-called, that we could allow more liberal access and then have hard drugs, which we would have a medical access, but more tightly controlled, not prohibition, but more tightly controlled, requiring prescription or something like that. I think that would be a, a more tenable model. Well, we, know, we have an information. <laughs> Just quick reaction. I don't want to be, I don't want to moderate, but not only, talk, I don't want to talk, but let me say one. Uh, we are in the, German-speaking country, uh, so maybe it's it's good to, to mention uh, uh, the one. I mean, the the, the the one of the biggest beginnings of prohibition on, on in 20th 
century happening in the Third Reich, during the Hitler era, 1933, he banned, banned um, hashish, raw opium, and cocaine. At that time, uh, the Hitler's administration had a ministry of uh, healthy lifestyle. And they collected quite up-to-date, let's say, uh, they collected data that could be used even today. I mean, the, the, the methodology and the, the way they collected was quite thorough. And uh, before the end of the war, well, that's to your point, before the end of the war, the, the ministry started warning the, the Hitler's cabinet that the, this, uh, this prohibition on cocaine, uh, uh, raw opium, and hashish caused double of alcohol problem use. So in Central Europe today, from the 1933, the alco problem alcohol use is quadrupled. Uh, I am quite convinced that the, the numbers still exist somewhere and some people do remember. So the prohibition is, also, is not only ideology and pure chance, it's also a business, uh, business situation. So we have to be, I think, aware of it. So uh, of course these, these substances influence each other and the market is not separated as cannabis market. Uh, uh, alcohol market, it influences each other, it can influence each other, uh, the, the whole thing. We have a situation in Czech Republic when we had 11,000 uh, heroin users estimation 10 years ago, we have only three and a half uh, uh, thousand est estimation because we have buprenorphine, which is another, another op opioid drug, which is less harmful. And, and people switch to it, and it's more accessible. So obviously, if we think of regulated market, uh, market, and I agree that we should maybe look individually, probably different situation with heroin and different situation with raw opium or opium tinctures, as well as different situation with hemp and cannabis, and hashish and some extracts, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. That should be probably. But do we want actually regulations? That's another question, yes, because not everybody maybe agree with regulated market rather than full legalization. So that's also another question that should be there. Uh, as, as my colleague here from Parliament, we proposed in Czech Republic the, the self-growing to be, to be uh, decriminalized. And we said that the, it's a first step to show the public that nothing is, nothing horrible is going to happen. It's pro I mean, it's our hypothesis, of course, we can say, but, and I hope we will be able to follow it thoroughly, but uh, I think this will show that these things are, are myths. I think there's an addition to your question as well, and that is, is it really an alternative uh, between prohibition and regulation, or is if you have some other alternative that you'd like to aim for, is regulation an, a, a, an incremental step towards that? Like, like in the United States, we have an awful lot of people in the cannabis culture and the cannabis movement that want cannabis completely removed from control, completely removed from schedules. And in fact, plant materials in their natural form don't seem to really fit in these kind of regimens. But we've never really found any way to do that other than as an incremental step to reschedule and then deschedule. So if you want to deschedule, you may have to reschedule. So if you want to remove from control or not regulate, would you have to regulate first as an incremental step? But definitely, I agree with the colleague here that uh, very emotional statement, but I agree with that, that uh, putting people to prison and even to death is a criminal activity. That's, that's I, I said it in, in UN. Uh, speech as well before as, as a member of the government, I mean, on behalf of the government. Hanka. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my name is Hanka Gabrielova, I'm a member of FAT. And <clears throat> uh, I want to point to one thing that, uh, because we are talking about the sustainable development regarding the cannabis, and we are talking also about regulation and taxes. And uh, I was working uh, some years as an energy campaigner for NGOs. So I was working a lot on these like fossil fuels 
productions and like uh, this dirty energy production, nuclear waste, uh, nuclear uh, uh, plants. And uh, there was always the part about the externalities. Yeah, that like we was like counting the price of the of the cost of the electricity, but in the end of the day, there was like much higher price because there was like such a big like kind of impact of the of these industries on the on the environment, which was later on like the damage of the environment was paid from the government budget. Yeah, even like insurance for like security of the nuclear power plant, it's still paid by the government budget. Yeah, so. My proposal uh, for I ha how I see the kind of uh, how the cannabis can, can what we can offer as a cannabis industry to these like uh, sustainable development policies is that uh, if we if we are able to set up the standards on like based on the organic and sustainability uh, rules, what I what my proposal was my proposal in the morning. What I would like to see as an environmentalist uh, to grow always organic, kind of like hold the like the the plant uh, plant material as as it is, not like poison it, uh, keep the nature. I think we can kind of call or try to make the proposal because n now we have the the credits for co2 production yeah now it's the, the culture of the industry is that if you poisoning you pay some extra yeah but like how how this is counted yeah i think like but nobody will pay less if you don't poison yeah so only the rich companies which poison the most they have money to pay back their fees yeah like normal people they have, they there is like no like lower taxes for like if you don't pose them. so so the people are not really motivated like just like doing good yeah so i think like if we as a cannabis industry are able to propose kind of like green credit for the society by like production of of hemp because we produce so much oxygen we save so much greenhouse emission through the like growing hemp and we save a lot of greenhouse emission even like if we build the houses from hemp because they still store a lot of CO2. So we kind of like can count how much beneficial can the cannabis industry be if we take the right way, yeah? If we don't grow in the like under lights uh, and like using like uh, pesticides, yeah? This is like not the part of the industry I'm talking about. I'm talking about some kind of like conscious contributions of the cannabis industry, yeah? And if we can create kind of like conscious contribution, green credit, yeah, of the cannabis industry, I think like we can kind of like, first of all, like have kind of like common stamp, like that we doing something what we can be proud of, yeah. We can inspire each other, yeah. We can kind of like network all together. This is about like the bridges. And we can like have some proposal for the future also, yeah. Because like if we still talking just about the Taxing, like taxing, it's cool, but like nobody likes taxes, yeah. Everybody likes like decrease taxes, yeah. So if we like able to pre pre like propose like this conscious green uh, contribution with like decre like decreasing the CO2 and so on, and we can count it well and propose okay, like because like this is part of the industry which is doing really well. Instead of like we don't pay like back, we just like doing good. So give us I don't know like one tax. Free or I don't know. Yeah, some I, I'm not economist, so I can hardly give you some like exact proposal for for taxing the new <laughs> sustainable cannabis industry. I just like like the idea, be, be, the difference between be, because it was very hard for me. I was doing the study because in Czech Republic was mined a lot of uranium during like uh, the the communists, and the, all the uranium was like moved to, to Russia and we have a lot of cleanup operations still going on and cost like a lot of billions of Czech rounds every year still, even like after 20 years. So I was trying to, and, and nuclear industry is still like we are cheap and clean, yeah? So it's not, not true, yeah? So I was trying to count this cost in the, in the kilowatt hour and it was like very hard, yeah? So I don't think it's like, like good if, if we accept as a society, pay something back because you never can pay back. You have to pay good. You have to pay less because you're doing good. You have to be motivated to do good and not do bullshit, make a lot of money and pay back, yeah? 
So, so if somebody likes this idea, we can talk about it on some coffee. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're not the economist, but you are a practitioner. <laughs> You're a practical person, no? Okay, there is. Uh, so there is one more hand at the back, and and then uh, I think it's very late now. But I have to admit, I've been to many conferences, and almost half past eight, and you're still sitting here. You deserve a clap, I have to say. <laughs> That's not <laughs> true. Man. Okay, two more, two more comments, but very short, please. It's really boring because you've got to read it in the entire time that I've been speaking. It talks about the barren right that uh, possession, right? If we have the right to possess, I have the right to cultivate, I have the right to store it, I have the right to package it, I have the right to sell it to my friend, I have the right to sell it collectively, but there are regulations around that that are very simple. R18, place of sale, labeling, responsible advertising, all that is in five pages. It is about seven paragraphs, and the most valuable component of it is that it doesn't even talk about cannabis. It makes provision for MDMA. It makes provision for LSD. It makes provision for all these things. It's just simply called the Restricted Substances Regulations. If you simply Google that and put it in quotes and put 2008 after it, you will have read it in the time I've been speaking. The funny thing about this, when I'm asked about it, they say, how come we haven't heard about it? It's really simple. Good drug policy is really boring. <laughs> okay. Last hand up. Can you please, can somebody bring it there? And then we will finish. Well, hello. Uh, my name is Umberto Nogueira. I'm, f I'm here representing Portugal and Angola. Um, first of all, uh, for all uh, it looks like most people here have some kind of connection um, with cannabis. Uh, so I ask you to educate people who doesn't. And by doing that, first thing we, I believe we have to mention or to, to explain to people is cannabis and mankind, it's kind of 12,000 years relationship. It's, uh, it's kind of as old as agriculture. So tell people about it so they show a bit more respect for cannabis, <laughs> at least. That's the first point. Uh, second, um, I really want to know, what's your opinion here? Um, hemp producers have a lot of issues, uh, mostly us from Portugal. We are dealing with a lot of bureaucracy and um, kind of the industry is being delayed there because there's something called hemp derived CBD and pharmaceuticals company there want to, everything is medicinal. But there's another issue uh, and it's not for, only for Portugal, it's also for any EU state member. We are dealing here with the 0.2% limit, uh, legal limit of THC. So last decade, decade uh, everyone was freaking out about global warming and all of a sudden for, uh, since 2010 it's not, not global warming anymore, it's kind of climate change. So. 
Um, as a uh, farmer and a ham consultant and a ham products retailer from Portugal, um, let me tell you something. We are uh, at southern latitudes. First of all, 0 0.2 was something invented by French. So, northern latitudes, nothing related to what, what the climate we have there. And we, since we are living under severe extreme weather events, uh, let me tell you, uh, this year, uh, officially, I was the first um, uh, to do a hemp crop in a greenhouse in Portugal, officially. Uh, we had 46 degrees there in a heat wave like never seen before. So, most of you can imagine, 0 0.2 was... <laughs> you know, but thankfully we saved like uh, that. That zero point two exceeded only twelve percent. So tell me, what can we do uh, for cannabis policies to predict the current uh, climate, extreme weather events we are living? Please, can we have a regulation uh, that allow us, uh, th that give us freedom, uh, control, but freedom of THC limits? That's the question I would like to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, close the discussion. We have a technical announcement as well, which Hanka will uh, announce. Okay. Yeah. Well, technical. Well, it is a technical, no? No, is we talk okay? about it like Friday. Like, uh, yeah. I think I, I, I may have a question also, like, by this technical comment also to his, his kind of uh, statement. We, everybody knows that like climate change is like the big issue and will not be better if we don't do kind of like big step <laughs> somewhere else than just forward. <laughs> we just like speeding the speed <laughs> and we think that like something go, going to happen without us to just like do some like crucial change. Yeah, it's it will not like that. Yeah, if we want to see the the change happen, we need to really like step back everybody a little bit and like everybody try to kind of, kind of think what's your personal impact on the on the on the on the climate change and how you can influence like be more impactable on the climate change and one of the way it's to use hemp yeah and all of us we are sitting here we can use hemp any many ways yeah like, how many people from this plenary use hemp every day? Give a hands up. Wow, that's good. Okay. <laughs> very good, very good. good okay. So, well, you can feed your friends <laughs> every day. I just, like, mean, like, more we will use it on everyday basis. We are just, like, speeding the kind of, like, growth on the industry, yeah? And more we talking about that, we also speed up this is like how we can influence, yeah? This is like first step. And, and, and influence these like rising, rising uh, THC limits. Believe me, we talk about that in our industrial, uh, European Industrial Hemp Association as well, yeah? But this is like very conservative group. They are from Germany, yeah? It's not really good for open this discussion to increasing some, some THC up to 0 0.3, which is the conservative limit of some other countries. So uh, I think this will happen just with some like international regulation change, yeah? So maybe when we kind of like w talking about the schedule of cannabis in UN and we need to set up some limit because in the treaties, the industrial hemp, it's legal. But now it's the question, like, because in the UN treaties there is like no limit, yeah? It's just like international uh, industrial use, yeah? Pavel Pachta is like saying yes, so I, I'm good. <laughs> and uh, so I think like this can be kind of like our, our proposal, yeah, For, from the industry, yeah? Because like these limits are very weird, yeah? Some countries have one, some countries 0 0.2, some countries uh, even like 0 0.6, 0 0.5, yeah, crazy, yeah, really crazy if you want to become the global uh, industry uh, company, yeah? It's like very difficult, believe me, yeah? Even like in Europe, it's very confusing. And 
So I think like we really have to just like work more together. Yeah, this is like really, I'm very happy that we did like this event happen because it's like really first time when like cannabis, it's like sound nearby the UN and we can talk about that. Yeah, and bring it this Don't forget more. the document to announce. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so this, uh, what we did, and this is like why I, I want to talk about it again. Uh, we launched this document, the Sustainable Cannabis and Sustainable Development policy or sustainable development goals. Uh, we launched it in, in the UN on our like lunch uh, on Friday. And uh, this is the discussion document. Don't forget, this is discussion document. This is just first draft. So everybody who feels something to add, please feel free to send feedback. We will do first, second edition, third edition. We will, we will use it, we will use it, it's our tool. It can be our common to how we want to like communicate our topic and bring like more and more science behind it. We did it because WHO did evaluation cannabis related to human health. And it's not enough. Cannabis human health, it's not enough. Cannabis has big potential not only for health but for environment, for, for material source. And we need to evaluate all what was the influence on like kind of like cutting cannabis plant from our lives because of the prohibition. So now we are getting more and more like new modern uses of hemp, which can like help us to solve this climate change, hopefully. And we should like try to use it and try to do it because we have not much other chance how <laughs> to stop this like fast speed. Uh, to just, uh, I don't know what, I don't want to even like think about that, what can happen if we don't stop to do that, yeah? And, and again, these green credits can be like maybe nice motivation, yeah? And uh, maybe if we start to talk about the revenues and motivation uh, and kind of like solutions instead of just like uh, talking about the bad impact of the drug policy, what we usually talk, <laughs> if we talk in the drug, uh, drug plenary meetings. So it can be maybe for the people more interesting to hear us. So I, I see that like move a more open floor for cannabis uh, discussion uh, very positively, the sustainable Anka, goals. Where, where do we get this document? Yeah, how this do document we, how do we coming uh, uh, in, to tonight in, in Vienna. ourselves in the discussion? Uh, this document coming to Vienna will be also online to download on the FATWA page uh, for small donation. Uh, I think we will decide to send it like all of you, like by email for free. And uh, uh, I think like there will be like no deadlines where you have to like give some comments, yeah, it's like, you and feel free. what do we free. want to do with the document afterwards? Uh, this document we will, we will use when we update it time to time and like use it in our like policy work to the UN, yeah? Like depends like how it will evolve, but uh, because like we are not really successful on the, on the, on the like work with the CND, yeah? Like sadly, this Friday experience wasn't like really, Kind of like big, big, big kind of like be happy about that, yeah. So, and, and it, it's like last 10, 15 years. So we probably have to try to go some another floor in the UN where they're trying to solve some, some issues where cannabis can play some role and maybe talk to them, yeah. And maybe they will like talk to them in some coffee, like on their like levels and solve it somehow different. But we kind of like very frustrated on like talking to the CND they don't understand climate change at all, yeah? But we humans, we human beings, we kind of like want to survive. I want, I want to really like survive in this planet and I don't really think that like something else can help more than this planet, yeah? So it will really like make me sleep better if we can like kind of like bring it back to the field and start to use it. How our like parents was used it always, yeah? Thank you very much for your being here.